And so, God, we thank you for reminding us today. Sometimes we need that reminder. Sometimes we need that reminder, God. And so we thank you, even for this moment. Thank you for making this house your home. Holy Spirit, we just lean on you today. We lean on you, Holy Spirit. And we learn to be patient and careful in your presence. So do what only you can do, oh God. In this word, and this message, we're trusting that every person that came here, God, is going to get a word that they needed from you. I gladly get out of the way so that you can speak. We honor you. In Yeshua's name we pray. All of God's people say it. Amen, amen. As, as it is our custom here, if you're still worshiping, you can keep worshiping. Um, my custom when I'm getting ready to speak is uh, the Holy Spirit can say more to you in one moment than 10,000 messages. So if you need a moment just to, to stay in the presence of God, that's the most important thing. That's, that's what the world needs is the presence of God. So if you're there, stay. You can ignore me. It'll be on live later. But just keep worshiping. Um, I want to get into this word for the, for the sake of honoring your time. Let's do it. For the sake of honoring your time, I want to get into this word. If you're new here, I want you to know up front we are a true church. That means we are transparent, real, and unedited. All right? We're transparent, real, and unedited in everything that we do. I believe that... Uh, the more transparent, the more real, the more unedited we are, the better we're able to actually live out the word. Uh, I was born and raised in church, and one of the things that uh, always frustrated me was sometimes the ambiguity or the, the, um, the, the confusion after hearing a scripture, hearing a message, and how do I actually live this out? How do I actually do this? So you say, trust in God, and you're like, what does that look like in my condition? And what does it look like in my situation? And so uh, our goal in approaching the text is always to make it plain. The Bible says make it so plain that a fool went error. Make it plain so that a person who is going through a difficult season in life doesn't have to leave church and guess how do they follow God, right? And so I want to get into this message today that God put on my heart. And this message is from this title, Fighting Unforgiveness. Fighting unforgiveness. Uh, so many of you are battling with this right here. And if I were to be bold in making a statement, I'll say that this is one of the greatest fights you're going to have in your life. It's not about how you deal with God. God is consistent. It's about how you deal with people. And more specifically, how do you deal with people after they've hurt you? How do you deal with people after they've wounded you? And if you are alive, which means you are breathing and in a standard state of consciousness, you are going to live with having to forgive somebody. Some of us will have to forgive more than others. As a matter of fact, I'll even say the greater your call, the greater your purpose, the more you have to forgive. Right? You heard the old adage, new levels, new devils. Right? And there are some levels you cannot get to without getting through these kinds of pain, these kinds of hurt. There are things you're going to have to experience in order to get to what God has for you to get to. The old school church would say, this kind of anointing comes with a cost. Yeah. Right? So to get to where you have to get to, you're going to get through some stuff. You're going to live through some fights. But I want to help you unpack just how do we win this fight? Because it's going to be a fight, but how do we win it? So we'll start off with this definition. What is unforgiveness? Based on biblicalcounseling.com, unforgiveness is a state of emotional and mental distress that results from a delayed response in forgiving an offender. It is characterized by indignation, bitterness, and a demand for punishment or restitution. And this is one of those real places when you're in unforgiveness, you know what that feels like because it's almost like, God, I'm demanding that you get them back for me. 
You know, it's not right what they said about me. It's not right what they're doing to me. It's wrong how they're treating me as if I'm the offender. It's wrong that they could cut me and watch me bleed and tell me to get my own bandage. I'm frustrated, God, and I need you to get them for me. And when you're in a place where you're demanding that God gets you restitution, that you're demanding that God sends punishment, then you're probably still in a place of unforgiveness. You're probably still in that place because it's difficult to pray for someone you haven't released. It's difficult to pray for someone you haven't released from your spirit. And I want to get into these scriptures because I don't have enough time to wade too long in the text, but I need you to get this lesson today. So I need you to be a smart class, okay? We can't be a slow class today. You got to get your amens out right away and say, I get you, Pastor, hallelujah, so we can keep going forward. Amen. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6 and 11. It says, this verse speaks to me, maybe because of the way that it starts, but it says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. It says, pursue this. Whenever the Bible uses the word pursue, it means these things will elude you or they will seem as if they're running away from you. I'll make it more plain. When you're going through difficult situations, it is hard for you to pursue love. When you feel like the person you're trying to show love to is using every opportunity to hurt you. It's hard for you to pursue gentleness when it feels like people are being very hard and cold and rude and disrespectful and even distasteful to you. It's almost like, God, how do you expect me to be gentle when the people I have to deal with are so difficult to handle? But it's in those places you have to pursue, which means it's not going to be comfortable. Watch this. And it's not going to come to you. You got to go get gentleness. You got to go get love. You got to go get peace. You have to go get endurance. And the only way you get it is you get it in the fight. You get it in the fight. Verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He said, fight the good fight of faith. And the biggest point we need to understand is that it's not faith in God. That's not the hard part. Many of you have faith in God. The fight for you is doing what God told you to do. That's the fight. The fight isn't, will I listen to God or will I love God? The fight is, God, what you're asking me to do feels so difficult, sometimes even impossible, God, that you're asking me to do this. And one of those biggest fights of faith is forgiveness. The Bible says, fight the good fight of faith. Forgiveness is a fight. And I, I was raised in the hood, right? Or the ghettos, if I don't know whichever one you call it. But uh, I was raised in difficult environments and being raised in it, I fought a lot. Anybody else fought a lot growing up? All right. You know, and then you have them people that, that act like they knew how to fight, but you never saw them fight. Oh, I got hands. I'm like, I ain't never seen you fight. You went, you dodge a fly. You understand what I'm saying? But, but I was raised fighting a lot. My family's here, they tell you, I got suspended almost every week from school. My name was Lil Kenny to the family. They would say, Lil Kenny bad, right? Because he fought all the time. One of the things I learned about fighting, though, is that uh, you can't go in scared. Not scared of the fight, because you're going to always be nervous. But you can't be scared to get hit. Because if you fight enough, somebody going to hit you. And somebody's going to knock your head up. And somebody's going to knock you to the ground. But it's not about how hard you can hit that helps you to win the fight. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep fighting. It's about how much you can take and keep going. And that is the fight of unforgiveness. It's not about how much you can keep going and proving you're anointed. The real fight is, God, how much can I take and not lose my purity? How much can I take and not lose my heart? How much can I deal with these people? How much can I deal with these folk? How much can I deal with them and not lose the gentleness you've given me, not lose the patience you've given me, not lose the joy you've given to me? Because some of you, you're staying in conditions, but the problem is the condition is changing you. 
It's changing you, and the goal of God is for you to have peace in the storm. The goal of God is for you to be so fortified in him that your conditions don't alter your inner being. It's a fight with unforgiveness, and forgiveness is a fight. And when it comes to the fight of forgiveness, I learned a while ago that, that you don't have to win every fight, but you have to fight every fight. You don't have to win every fight, but you got to fight every fight. Why are you saying this, Pastor? Because there's going to be some people that God going to tell you to forgive, and it's going to feel like you're losing. People don't want to talk about. There are times where you have to forgive people and it feels like you're losing. They walking around prideful and arrogant and telling their side of the story and lying. And you got to sit right here and be quiet and trust God. And it feels like you're losing. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to always feel like a win now. It's not going to always feel like a win now, but what the devil meant for evil, God can take that same thing and flip it. God can take the same thing and flip it on his head. You have to fight. You're not going to win them all, but you got to fight them all. If you run from them, then you're not overcoming unforgiveness. If you hide from it, then you're not overcoming unforgiveness. Some things you have to face head on like a collision. In Matthew 18 and 21, we find Peter asking Jesus about this same topic of forgiveness. And Peter, he asked Jesus a very important question. He's an apostle. He's anointed. It says, Peter came and asked him, Matthew 18 and 21, he says, Lord, uh, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, Peter thought this was an anointed number. Number seven is the number of completion, right? Also, the number that Peter offered was more than what most of us would offer. Uh, Because I I don't know about you, but I'm not offering you seven. (laughs) I'm going to act too saved. That's okay. But I'm not not offering you seven times. You can cut me seven times, right? I'm not not doing it. I'm not playing them in the silly games. You know what I'm talking about? Like, that's not what I'm going to do. So Peter thinks he's offering a pious number, a righteous, a holy number, if you would. Uh, Should it be seven times? He's showing he's stretching himself in forgiveness. And then Jesus obliterates his number. In verse 22, Jesus says, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 70. Somebody said, oh, my. That's when you, that's when you get to a place you don't have nothing to say to God. Yeah, oh, my. He's, he's, he's 490 times for those that they need quick math. You need to forgive almost 500 times. And Jesus throws out a number that is essentially saying, you're going to lose count before I let you hold on to bitterness. Hallelujah. I'm coming for you today. You are going to lose count before I let you hold on to bitterness because unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. It's, 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 he has to clean it out of you. He has to purify it from you. And he shows that there is this, this challenge, this 490 times. Now, we got to talk practical because these kind of scriptures would get thrown out in church to me, and then it just gets dropped. And I'm like, all right, pastor, you got to say something else because 490 still don't sit right with my spirit. It's okay. Y'all, y'all, y'all got that fake right now. Like, I know when I say 490, some of y'all in your head said, to. But four is too much. So 490 is ridiculous, right? So what do we do, Pastor? How do we start to, in some practical thinking, walk some of this stuff out, all right? So let's address it first. The unspoken challenge about forgiveness is every day you have to remind yourself that you have forgiven the offender. Every day. What happens in moments like this? You hear a powerful message. You come to church. You feel good. We worship. God is able. You come get prayer. You walk out of church. Tears are flowing. And in that moment, you feel lighter. You're like, man, I feel good. I really feel like this message was what I needed today. I released the person. I let them go. I'm good. But then you wake up tomorrow. And when you wake up tomorrow, it doesn't feel like Sunday. It doesn't feel the same. I, I kind of feel what I said I let go of. And I start to think about the pain, and that's the dangerous part because memory can bring up not just the experience, it brings up the pain you felt from the experience. 
You can relive it over and over in your head. And so now you're thinking about it. And sometimes even worse is you find out something new that you never knew about and you thought you forgave him. You're like, I forgave you for the first six things, but this seventh thing, I never even knew you said that. And, and, and you're battling and you got to remind yourself to release it again. You got to wake up on Tuesday morning and remind yourself to release it again. I'm trying to help you walk out forgiveness for real. You got to wake up Wednesday morning and say, I'm not going to pick back up what I put down yesterday. I'm not going to pick back up bitterness. I'm not going to pick back up anger. I'm not going to let it change and affect the way that I move. And I'm telling you this right now. When you go through stuff and it's changing how you move, then you lost. I'm trying to help you with this because the goal of the enemy was to change you. I hope you get this. The goal of the enemy was to get you to be a little less pure, a little less forgiving, a little less happy, a little less joyful, a little less you know, uh, passionate about your calling and your purpose, a little less focused on your assignment, just, just a little less. And when you go through these situations and you let them change you, you may think you're fine, but the enemy is saying, that's all I wanted to do. I knew you weren't going to give up on God, but if I can get you to give up on people. That's all I needed because you forgot the second commandment is equal to the first one, to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't just love God and park in that garage. You got to come out and love people too. So you have to remind yourself every day I've forgiven this person. And when the emotions come back to, rem to remind yourself that we don't live by our feelings, we live by faith. To remind yourself that this is not to negate your feelings. Your feelings are real, but your feelings should not be your prophecy. If my feelings were my prophecy, I wouldn't be standing here today because there was a time I didn't feel like I was worth it. There was a time I didn't feel adequate. There was a time I didn't feel called. But thank God I didn't listen to my feelings. I listened to my father. All right. Here we go. A couple more points that are critical for just understanding how to walk our forgiveness. The closer they are, the harder it is to forgive. Okay, if there's somebody at work that you just went to lunch with and you get into it, oh well, I'm going to get a new work buddy. You don't like me, cool. I'm going to stand at this job anyways. I'm transferring out tomorrow. You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't care about that. I could care less, right? You know, or a friend you just met, you'd be like, nah, you know, you're my friend, but, you know, you're not really my friend. See, some of y'all laughing because you've been there like, I mean, you mad at me, whoop de doo right? God bless you. Then there's other people who are like, y'all been friends for a long time. And when you've been betrayed by somebody you share intimate truths with, it hurts a bit different. And it comes with family, and you know, family, that's even tougher. Because I didn't choose y'all. Just, I just got to deal with it. Right? It don't matter how much your brother irritates you, your sister lied, it don't matter what happened. You just got to be like, God, dog it, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Mac and cheese. <laughs> cheese and rice. Right? I'm, 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 I'm frustrated, but, but that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt any less. I'm frustrated because I have a hard time disconnected what I was born into. So it's a difficult one, but it gets deeper when it's somebody that you're intimate with. When it's a relationship, when it's a spouse the, the, the forgiveness gets tougher because that is somebody you chose. You chose them. So now you're struggling, number one, to forgive somebody who knew so much about you, all of your secrets, all of your private spaces, and you're like, I'm trying to figure out how could they do this to me. And at the same time, you're trying to forgive yourself for not seeing it sooner. I know it's tough, I know. So you're battling with two levels of unforgiveness because you're trying to forgive the hurt and the pain, and you're also trying to forgive yourself for not reading the red flags when God was trying to show it to you. And so part of the reason you're angry with them is because you're angry at yourself for not recognizing. Oh, I, I know. So it's a battle with unforgiveness, and one of the things you got to do is you got to learn to release stuff quicker because... The faster you release, the easier it is to release. The faster you release, the easier it is to release. If you forgive quickly, 
then you're able to move on right away. If you forgive quickly, then you're able to keep going. But the longer you hold on to poison, the longer you hold on to toxicity, even once you decide to let it go, it still feels like it's a part of you because the bitterness has lived in you for so long. The anger has lived in you for so long. And some of you guys are still reaping the repercussions of bitterness from people you should have forgiven years ago. And now that you've made a decision in your mind to forgive them, you have to walk out intentional steps every day. What does it look like for me to forgive you every day? Because the forgiveness I gave to you yesterday doesn't always feel real tomorrow. Sometimes I have to remind myself, you forgiving them, you released it, keep going. And then a other practical one is the more you sacrifice for them, the harder it is to forgive. The more you sacrifice for someone, the harder it is to forgive. So this is why parents feel so betrayed if they feel like they sacrifice for their kids. So much that their kids hurt them, there's like a deep level of betrayal. It's the same thing that happens in relationships and marriages when a person feels like I lost myself to help you. And then still you cut me while I was trying to help you. I sacrificed so much, I'm hurt because of what I gave up to try to make it work. And it still didn't work. So you have to learn to process through this and what does it mean and ask yourself, why did I sacrifice so much? Some I had to learn. Why did I sacrifice so much? Because we forget that we cannot change or save anybody. Only Jesus can. I'm going to keep going. And what happens in church is Christians pick up this savior mentality and thinking that I can be saved for you and I can do all of the praying for you and I can do the changing for you and you cannot. You were called to be Christ-like but not the Christ. I'm going to help you, all right? And if you're not careful, you get into this place of where you're trying to do it for somebody else and you would even, if you're not careful, be willing to kill yourself to heal them. And that's what Jesus did. I want to be like Jesus. He killed himself to save others. Yes, he did. And he also died at 33. Because the difference is he was born to die. He was born to die. But God said, he also said, but I came, I died that you may have life. And here you are killing yourself, somebody he died for. For somebody else who doesn't even want him. Who doesn't even want God. And there's nothing worse than killing yourself to heal somebody else. And killing yourself to heal somebody else. And imagine, Jesus gave his life for us and still we complain God ain't did enough. <laughs> Come on, God, I need more. He gave his life. Imagine you giving your life for somebody else and they still tell you that's not enough. It's the pain, it's the level of trying to walk through what forgiveness looks like. Now, as we're talking about what forgiveness looks like in its practical form, I also have to be practical in telling you what forgiveness is not, okay? Because forgiveness is not pretending to be ignorant or pretending to be healed, okay? So I'll explain it really quickly. Forgiveness is not pretending to be ignorant. We taught this saying, which is terrible, forgive and forget. How, Sway? Right? What have you forgotten thus far? You remember everything, your first heartbreak, the first person that lied on you, your first fight, right? You remember because that's a part of our, our genetic makeup. God gave us memory so we can always remember the things he's brought us through, but the enemy hijacks our memory and makes us remember all the pain we've lived through, right? And so you're never going to forget. The reality is you have to forgive and remain. Now, what does that mean? It's about making sure that when I'm forgiving, that I don't walk away with that person still holding a piece of my soul. I have to remain who God called me to be. And when you walk in unforgiveness, what you're actually doing is you're telling that person, even though I'm leaving you, you can hold a piece of my happiness. You can hold a piece of my peace, a piece of my joy a piece of my wholeness, and a piece of my healing. Because until I release you, you always have me. 
until I release you, you always have me. And that's why that person at any moment, whenever they want to, at any time, could walk into your life and disrupt your peace because you won't release them. Oh, I'm talking good. It's okay. And it's not until you get to a place of saying, I have released that I'll be able to walk in total freedom, right? Total freedom. And it's a real thing when it comes to this forgiveness and, and, and not pretending. The reason I say you can't pretend, right? Not pretending is the biggest part of really walking in forgiveness and healing. It's the biggest part. Because God can't help you with something you keep faking on. Man, I'm telling you right now, one thing I'm going to keep coming for is the fake saints, right? I'm going to keep coming for it because I've seen it for far too long where there's a pretense to be perfect and I'm good and you're pretending to forgive them and you're hurting yourself. This is why. What, what, what I was raised that you got to forgive them and just keep going. So what I would try to do is once I tell somebody I forgive them, I try to go be around them as my proof that, that I forgave them. So now I'm going out to lunch with you. Now I'm hanging out, and I know. I, I know I'm still hurt. I know I am, but I'm pretending to be better or further than what I actually am. And what I'm doing is I keep re-triggering the pain. Every time I see a tendency or every time they say something, or every time they laugh at somebody else, now I'm like, they were probably laughing at me the same way. They was probably talking about me the same way. Now you're being re-triggered all because you couldn't be real enough to say, though I've forgiven you, I need to disconnect for a minute just so I can make sure I see clearly and I can make sure my discernment is intact and I can make sure that it's God leading me because I need to be honest and say, I'm not sure this was a God relationship. And hey, y'all gonna keep faking. It's okay, I'm coming for you. I'm not sure it was a God relationship, so sometimes I got to disconnect just so I can make sure I actually even see you correctly. Because if I stay close to you too long, I only see you as the pain you gave to me. But when I disconnect, I get my vision corrected, and I get a chance to see you are a child of God. You just battle with some nasty spirits. All right, that's cool. I'm going to keep going. You got to be able to confess it. You got to be able to confess it. James 5 and 16 gives it this way. Uh, it says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Our last verse and I'm done. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. He says, so this is what I need you to understand. He's giving them a lesson. He said, um, uh, confess, confess your sins to each other, to one another, so that, conjunction, you can be healed. What we've missed and mismanaged in church so much is that church hasn't been a safe place to confess. It hasn't been. Um, because when people confess, they're looked down at, they're talked about, rumors get started. And the worst thing you could ever do to a person who's confessing brokenness is to try to look at them as no longer being the anointed vessel of God that they have been the entire time. So, so people can't confess because they're trying to protect their calling. They're trying to protect their anointing. They're trying to protect their heart. And so they have to battle with this stuff in isolation. And this is why people are in church for 30 years and they never get healed. This is why. Because the Bible says, confess so that you can be healed. Confess so that you can be healed, which means that your healing is being held up by your confession. I'm only reading the same Bible you read. Your healing is being held up by your confession. And what happens when the trick of the enemy was not for you to say, okay, I'm going to try to be good and follow my purpose. No, the trick of the enemy was to taint the culture and to taint the environment so that every person that comes into a place of healing can't get healing because they can't confess what it is they actually need healing from. Well, well, I don't know about you, Pastor. I confess my stuff to God. 
I talk to God and God talks to me. I believe that. I believe you talk to God and God talks to you. But the Bible we just read said confess to one another. Because there is actually strength that comes when we come together in prayer. The strength that comes. Now watch this. I can't pray for your fight when I don't know what you're fighting. All right. I, I, we're supposed to pray for one another. The problem is you in a fight of your life. You are literally fighting for your life, but you're faking like you're happy in church. So everybody that keeps coming to you keeps coming with cake for celebration when really you need weapons for warfare. You need people that's coming with weapons and artillery saying, hey, bro, hey, sis, how you need me to fight in this season? Am I protecting your mind? Am I praying for your heart? Am I praying for your character? Am I covering your integrity? Am I covering your issue? Am I praying for your struggle? Am I praying for your deliverance? But because you keep saying, ain't God all right, and you're not telling the truth about where you are, your soldiers can't fight with you. So you losing in private, struggling and losing, and ain't nobody telling you it's supposed to be a fight. And you were ashamed to admit, because this was the worst thing you could ever do. You think that because I'm saved and anointed, I shouldn't still be fighting. Because God called me, because God used me, I shouldn't still be fighting. But he said, fight the good fight of faith, which means as long as you are alive, you're going to have a fight. But if I'm pretending, I can't even, I can't even tell the people that can help me I need help. I can't even tell the people that could, that could assist me I need assistance. I'm so busy pretending that my last season was the last season I struggled, that I'm good now. I'm straight. I don't need help anymore. So I had to come in here and I got a fake cry, but now my tears are not even worship. My tears are pain because I can't get out of what it is that I'm stuck inside of. But when I confess it, when I, when I, and I'm honest, when I'm open, then I'm able to be healed. And I know this. I know sometimes you can't confess it because when you're broken, you're like, the last thing I want to do is to confess my brokenness to people who are going to break me more. Don't break me more. Now when I tell them what I'm struggling with, now it's your fault. You should have did this. You should have said this. You should have been. And you're struggling. Like, how, how do I confess my brokenness to people who, who won't put me back together? How, how am I honest in a place where I'm so vulnerable, but my vulnerability is actually being used as a weapon against me? But let me tell you the goodness of Jesus. Let me tell you the goodness of God, that God will put you back together right in front of the people that broke you. Ooh, I'm trying not to preach right now. I'm trying not to preach. But God will put you back together right in front of the people that broke you. And so you struggling to be honest, but God is telling you don't worry about that. Because while they're judging you and hiding their issues, this time next year, you will be helped and healthy and moving, and they'll still be pretending. About what they're struggling with. That God will put you back together right while they're watching. He, he wants them to stay alive long enough to watch him bring you back together. He wants to that God would spare their life. He would not let them die until they see what he's doing inside of your life. You read in your Bible that God, he will wait for your enemies to be present before he brings the table. He'll put the table before you in the presence of your enemies. And remember, that wasn't the end of the verse. We all stopped there. But he said, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Then what's next? Then he begins to anoint my head with oil. My enemy's still washing. My cup is running over. My enemy's still washing. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the... While they are watching, while they are watching, God would do it. And I know I'm getting ready to do this when we talk about forgiveness. 
I'm going to be real with you and I'm done. That, that the church should be a place where people can come in and be honest right away. But it hasn't historically been that. And so sometimes you have spaces to be brave. Which means you have churches, you have friends, you have groups, you have those spaces to be brave. Sometimes you have that, but sometimes you don't have spaces to be brave. Sometimes you just have to be brave in a space. I got to be brave and I can't keep pretending like everything I've seen. I can't keep faking like everything I've seen. I, I got to believe God's word for myself. I got to actually believe this thing works for me. I got to believe that if I come to God and I'm honest, if I come and I'm open and I find the right ones to pray and intercede and to cover me, that God told me that he'll put me back together. I may have been marred in the potter's hand, but God will put me back together right in front of my enemies. I hope y'all stay alive long enough. I hope y'all stick around long enough. I hope you're here long enough just so you can watch what God does. When he puts you back together. But while he's putting you back together, you got to make sure you release the people you're holding on to. Because God can't put you back together when unforgiveness is keeping you broken. You got to be willing, willing to release. So let me pray for you. God, this is my prayer. That every person that my voice, God, that they would be in a place of honesty with you. God, you said confess that we may be healed. I pray, I pray that they would be healed in every single way. I pray that they would be restored, that this would be the beginning of a journey for them. It ain't going to be just today. We're, we're done with the, 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 the super saved Sunday, but we're going to need this walk every day. We need it on Monday. We need it on Tuesday. We need it on Wednesday. We need it on Thursday. We need it on Friday. We need this walk with you, God. And so I pray for their lives to be radically changed and I speak that they will win this fight once and for all. That they will win this fight once and for all. In Yeshua's name we pray. All of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. I pray this word bless you, add a life and value to you. I got two things I want to do real quick. I'm way over time, so I want to do this quickly. If there's anybody in here that's never got a chance to say yes to Jesus, what that means is you've never given your life to Christ. Where you want God to change your life and you accept it personally. You can come down at this time. Not going to make you say anything. Just want to get a chance to pray for you. Secondly, if you're looking for a church home and you enjoyed your experience here and you want to make this church your church home, we are more than happy just to love when you receive you. So anybody looking for a church home, you can come down at this time. Anybody want to give their life to Christ, you can come down at this time. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, keep giving God praise as they come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Till he comes, a wonderful change has come over me. A wonderful change. Changed my life completely, and now I sit, I sit at his feet to do.